the British critic, Quentin Crisp, he said, kids today are violent because they have no inner life. They have no inner life because they have no thoughts. They have no thoughts because they know no words. They know no words because they never speak, and they never speak because the music is too loud. Sorry, Kaiser. Um, in, in Washington, I feel like the music uh, is often too loud around US-China relations, and it tends increasingly uh, toward anger and uh, vitriol and defensiveness. And that's one of the reasons that uh, there's a tendency, perhaps, toward violence and a lack of inner life in some quarters in Washington. And I get to travel all over the country, and I tend to find, as I found here in Maine, that you have a, a very different set of views uh, that are more moderate, uh, more balanced, a little less political, a little bit more humanistic, and it's very refreshing. Uh, I think what we need to do now is to bring these two dialogues together, the Washington security concerns, with the broader, more humanistic views we find uh, throughout the United States. We've heard a lot of speakers uh, point out correctly that there are people, especially in Washington, who have this cartoon critique of engagement. You know, that it was about making China more like us, they're not like us, therefore the engagement has failed. And there are people who oppose engagement who have this kind of cartooned version of that. But there's also a bit of a, a cartooned critique of concerns about US-China relations as well that is a little bit too quick to dismiss them. And so I want to try to bring those together. And so it falls to me today at the end of this conference, which I think has been uh, very broad and very balanced, it falls to me to be a little bit of the heavy. Um, which is not the role I usually play. In, in DC circles, I'm, I'm sort of the, the culture guy who's suspected of being kind of limp-wristed and, and not sufficiently concerned about hypersonic glide re-entry vehicles. Uh, but here I'm gonna be the heavy, and I'm, I'm increasingly cast in this. It, you know, I've been in Washington long enough. I was, I was in Burlington last summer to give a talk to the APLU, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. And I was walking up to, from the, the waterfront, in the morning to the University of Vermont for the talk, and I, and I was dressed like this. I was overdressed and, and, and very hot, and so I went into a Vermont coffee shop uh, in the morning. It was called Uncommon Grounds. It's one of these virtue coffee shops that you find um, throughout New England, and it, it's shade-grown, and it's fair trade, and it's usually not very good, and it's very expensive. Virtue coffee is very expensive. <laughs> uh, and so I bought this cup of coffee, and I was the only person dressed like this. Everybody else was in cutoffs, and flip-flops, and I felt like I was getting the stink eye from everybody, and I, I, I sat down, and they, they seemed to sort of move away. And, and then my, my wife called, and I was sort of in a hushed voice telling about this. I said, everybody here is, is, seems to be looking at me like I'm the SOB from Washington. I've got an entire drawer full of tie-dye T-shirts, but you know, has, this, has this happened? Am, am I the son of a bitch from Washington? And my wife said, well, of course, you're not originally from Washington. Um, so it's one of those thanks, honey moments. Um, but so I want to start by talking about this question that they've lured us all in here with, but that nobody has really addressed. Uh, is this China's century? And of course, this is going to depend on uh, definitions. And there's one sense in which I think uh, the answer is almost certainly a resounding yes. And the answer is yes, in that uh, I'm fairly sure that for the vast majority of Chinese, uh, this will be the best century in history in which to be Chinese. By almost any measure, including the range of pers the exercise of personal freedom that most Chinese people have in their daily lives. And anybody who got there in the 80s or early 90s will see the difference. And so in th this is a tremendous human achievement that has to be recognized and celebrated. Uh, and as we get more concerned about China's rise, I think we have to remember, and this is often forgotten in Washington, that China's rise in the main is wholly legitimate. It's about human flourishing. There are aspects of it that do pose a challenge or even a threat to us, and therefore we've gotten in the habit in Washington of speaking as though China's rise is somehow aimed at us, and of course it's not at us in any sense, it's for them, as most Chinese experience it. Uh, so, of course, not all Chinese. Uh, Elizabeth has very 
importantly pointed out the way that since Xi Jinping uh, came to power, uh, many Chinese have felt uh, the increasingly heavy hand of the state and people whose personal happiness depends on exercise of what we would consider to be normal social and political freedoms uh, have uh, had a much more harder time of it and, and some of them have been locked up. But I think for most Chinese, at least in my experience, uh, they're still very happy to take the deal that the Chinese government has offered, that, that material life, technological life continues to get better for most of them. And in a country that was so recently, so desperately poor and so subject to so many kinds of violence and exploitation, both foreign and domestic, uh, that's an enormous benefit. So there, there's, a, there's a very important sense in which I think and hope that the answer to this question is yes. In another sense, if we, if we look at this question, is this China's century, which of course evokes the phrase that was originated, I think, by Henry Luce of America's century. That seems to be the implicit compar uh, comparison here. Will China, is China likely in the 21st century to have a global status similar to that that the United States uh, has enjoyed uh, since the end of World War II? Then I think the answer is probably no. And the reason is that I agree with the official Chinese position that the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, while it evolves, uh, will also endure. And I think there are a lot of reasons to believe that a China led by the CCP uh, is going to prove continually unable to develop American-style soft power, which I should note is an asset that we are currently bleeding out at an alarming rate. Um, so maybe, maybe it's, and I'll be interested to hear what the fellow speakers and all of you think, we should, we should get around to answering this question. Um, you know, it may be neither country's century. Maybe uh, it will be a more multilateral period, and the common challenge is going to be to achieve a stable balance. That may be a, a very good and desirable outcome. So uh, we have entered a new era in US-China relations. This was originally a Shiist phrase, Xin Shidai, the, the new era. And I think that it's merited. Uh, he and I would define it a little differently, but it's a merited phrase. And this new relationship between the United States and China is going to be characterized by long-term worldwide competition to shape global security architectures, trading regimes, technology development and regulation, a very important theme that this conference has, has properly stressed, uh, norms and practices, as Elizabeth mentioned, and also value systems. This is a high stakes contest, in other words, between pro two profoundly self-regarding and distrustful powers. Uh, that said, it, it's very important to note, I'm, I'm speaking at the political level. Uh, can I see hands on people who've been to China? We haven't done this, it's usually a really good, okay, great, almost everybody. Um, I can't see the students in the balcony, but those of you who haven't been, I, I hope you make it. Um, when I say that we're involved in this high stakes distrustful competition, I don't mean to imply that the Chinese are in any way anti-American. Uh, it's not true. Uh, I think the opposite is, very, is, is true. You go there and I think you'll find that they are marvelous hosts and interested in friendship and comparing experiences. This is not something that's true at the personal level and I don't think that Americans are anti-Chinese again at the personal level either. So there, when we can take some confidence in this. Nevertheless, it's a new era. Uh, and it's a new era in which I think there is a dearth of new ideas in both Washington and Beijing. I was at a conference uh, last March in Beijing. There were two held on the same weekend. I don't know if, if Elizabeth, you went to one of these or not. Uh, but it was a well-intentioned conference uh, in which a number of Americans who looked at China for a long time were invited to speak with Chinese counterparts who we've known for a long time. These people who know and, generally speaking, like and trust each other. And the question was, this, this relationship seems to be in steep decline. Does anyone have any ideas about how to keep it from going into free fall? Um, the answer is no. Nobody had any ideas about this. We were stuck in mutual accusation. Both countries seemed pretty sure that most of the fault lay with the other and that it was really a question of the other country waking up and smelling the coffee. When were you going to realize uh, how this had to be handled? It was really quite discouraging. It is a joint failure of imagination uh, that I think threatens our ability to manage this increasingly contentious relationship peacefully. So let's, I just want to talk a little bit about this failure of ideas on both sides. Uh, China first. Um, China, I think, is, as a nation, the polity is uh, more sure of its direction 
and its capabilities uh, than is the United States. I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute. Um, at the same time, I think there is a consistent failure and incapability uh, from Chinese officialdom. Um, and I want to keep, it's, it's very hard to have these quick talks about China because we tend to use shorthands like China, the PRC, the CCP, and it sounds like we're always talking about all of the Chinese people. So an obvious disclaimer, obviously that's, that's not true. China is vast and varied. Uh, there's a saying in Chinese, Lin zi da, shen yao dou you. It's a big forest, it's got all kinds of birds. Uh, and that's true in China, it's true in the United States. So shorthand here, I beg your indulgence with that. So China's more sure of its direction, but seems to have a hard time conceiving of China as one country among many, rather than as the Middle Kingdom. Uh, and what I mean by that is that in its quest for increased influence, soft power, what China calls discursive power, the ability to shape China's story worldwide, China to date has been really stymied, crippled by its insularity and by its very deep belief in Chinese particularism, or what uh, Xi Jinping in particular calls the tse. China has tse, it's different, it's sui generis. This is why Xi Jinping rejects the idea of universal values. And in the Shi'ist description of China's greatness, it is this tse, this essential and distinct Chineseness, which drives Chinese history and compels policy in certain directions. And because China is particularistic, uh, critiques from the outside of China are perhaps not legitimate. There's a rejection of universalism and a belief uh, you know, in Chinese wisdom. And you, you, you hear an increased emphasis on this, this Chinese-ness uh, in Shi'ist discourse, and it's not really working so well uh, outside of China. Again, it is true that China is a civilization state and that that needs to be continually re-examined if we are to understand China and, and, and deal with it properly. And so I think that you know, uh, Martin Jakes was quite correct to, to, to stress China's status as a civilization state. And one of China's greatest strengths in competition with the United States is a, a commonality of purpose among many Chinese. Now, St. Augustine said that a nation should be defined as a multitude of rational beings in common agreement as to the objects of their love. That, I would say, is not an apt description of the United States. <laughs> right now, in China, there are disagreements, it's true, but there's a relatively strong buy-in, top to bottom, and sense of national project. It's continued increases in individual well-being, material and technological first, and then I would say national status second. And people, Chinese argue about individual policies and timetables and points of emphasis and all this stuff, but that sense of national project is strong. I'm not sure we have one. It's strong within China. But when China then wants to project those same sets of values and beliefs internationally, we have already seen, and Beijing has heard, a tremendous amount of global blowback to, I think, what is primarily Chinese Shiist overreach. And we are seeing blowback to the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, even on China's doorstep, even to an extent in Pakistan, deep concerns in Kazakhstan, in Russia, uh, in the Maldives, uh, in Malaysia. I think that in the uh, various critiques that we're hearing of Huawei, um, and I don't want to go down that rabbit hole today, but no matter what you make of those critiques, it's a pushback against Chinese methods and Chinese practices, against these tse. You see this in the debate about China's influence on American domestic institutions and communities. And this is a debate that is echoed in the Five Eyes Nations in the UK, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Canada, and indeed in much of Western Europe. Again, pushback, blowback against Chinese methods. We saw this in the past year in which Chinese diplomats were uh, accused of being sort of very brusque, declarative, and, and, and really bullying, both in, in Papua New Guinea and Nauru. There's a blowback to the Chinese uh, tsa. That, that, that we see uh, going on around the world. Um, so why is China behaving in this way? What is Chinese foreign policy about? My shorthand for this, and, and this is something that is in, in need of critique and commentary, so you know, Wuxin Boy, you can have at me in the, in the, in the Q&A. Uh, but I've come to understand Chinese foreign policy as seeking, one, a world that is highly integrated. 
China, China is quite sincere about this. This works out for China. A world that is highly integrated, but wholly accepting of Chinese prerogatives and practices. And so the question becomes, what is, what is the nature of those prerogatives and practices? Uh, China, the CCP, treats its own people in a certain way. And as its power and influence and ambition spreads, it is able to treat, if you will, peoples in other nations in roughly the same way. And so the, one of the questions that we have to ask, regardless of, of all the many fine things that China has achieved, is do we want to live in a world that is increasingly amenable to an increasingly repressive at home and aggressive internationally uh, CCP? In other words, when we think of Chinese governance or Chinese global leadership, our moral judgment, I think, is quite properly invoked. Okay? And even with all of the many things that we could say about American hypocrisy and misjudgment and arrogance and violence, and yes, 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 I, I grant you everything. Um, but the choice between Chinese values and American values broadly, which are fundamentally different as they concern the relationship between authority and the individual, the choice between these two modes of governance or modernities. This is not like the choice between chocolate and vanilla ice cream. Very real issues uh, are at stake because of the nature of some of these Chinese practices um, that we've already discussed. And so the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, faces a dilemma as it tries to develop soft power. It believes strongly that because China is so vast and so complex and because of its history, only an authoritarian, strong central state can provide the kind of stability that is necessary for continued development. That's the basic proposition, and it's a defensible proposition. But because of that, the Chinese government has become accustomed to communicating with its own people in a very top-down, harsh, declarative way. And so when it goes overseas and tries to develop discursive power or soft power, it speaks in the same way, and people don't like it, and people don't have to put up with it. But China is finding that it can't adjust. It can't speak harshly at home and softly overseas, what they call Neiji and Wai Song, because China's too open. 150 million Chinese people travel every year. They read the internet. The Chinese people would know, and they wouldn't put up with it. So it's a true dilemma for China. They can't adjust, and they've had a hard time building soft power and build, getting buy-in, which is why I think they're going to have a hard time um, exercising the kind of power they would like in the 21st century. Uh, so a dearth of new ideas, and these new ideas are badly needed. You, Kaiser, we spoke to the uh, US-China Strong student group last year, and Kaiser said something I think is very, very important, and it stayed with me since, that when we speak of US-China relations, and this, you can correct me if I get the wording wrong, but the idea was that we have to contextualize that within the global history of ideas, intellectual history. And I, and, and I think that's right. So we need to focus on the ideational side of the relationship. Um, I think a failure of new ideas is all too obvious on the American side, where the idea seems to be uh, a kind of retrenchment that alternates between a defensive crouch and a sort of flailing that is as demeaning as it is ineffectual uh, internationally. And we heard this and stark display in uh, Vice President Pence's October 4th, 2018 speech at the Hudson Institute which was really a declaration of hostility to China. He said that China was a bad actor. It's a bad actor within its own borders. It's a bad actor internationally. It's a bad actor uh, within the United States. Um, and yet this was a, a, a litany of, of complaints that did not come close to comprising a strategy. And so a few, a few questions that it seemed not to ask, and I'll go through these really quickly, but these were to me the glaring silences in what Pence said. Um, and he went, it, w it was a very threatening speech. It went from, okay, China, here's what we don't like about you, to, therefore, we are upgrading our nuclear arsenal. <laughs> well, there's no interpretation required here. It was, it was very, it packed all together very closely. So the questions for America are things like, how much power do we still have? What costs are we willing to incur in this competition with China? Both how much can we afford, uh, and how much are we willing to suffer? In the, in the current trade frictions, there's a confidence in China that yes, there's gonna be deprivation uh, in China and deprivation in the United States, but they're pretty sure that they're tougher than we are, that they can eat more bitterness uh, than we can, at least when it comes to things like soybeans. Uh, and I think they're probably right about that. Um, there's also the moral question in this competition with China. How much harm are we willing to inflict? 
You know, th this is, whether it's China, the PRC or not, this is still one fifth of humankind. Is our policy going to be to harm their welfare uh, in order to continually win? Uh, another question that we have to address is, does our critique of China, and most of the things that Pence said, most of his criticisms, uh, with a few exceptions, were correct, important, and long-standing. Uh, nevertheless, it was primarily a litany of criticisms. And the problem I had with that is that his description of China doesn't come close to comp comprising China in its totality and in its complexity. And so, yes, we have an increasing you know, surveillance state, which trends toward a kind of soft totalitarianism. We have all these problems in China that you've been hearing about. But if you go to China for the most part, you're not going to see people skulking in the streets. You know, the energy and the ambition comes up through the sidewalks. You can feel it. It's, 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 it's marvelous. It's impressive. And the, the, our legitimate complaints about China right now don't comprise that. And unless we have a China strategy that includes China in its totality and complexity, we can't succeed. Um, and then uh, th one of the biggest questions, and this again comes back to this uh, failure of ideas, and this is both a failure of, of China's part as well. Can either of these nations envision, do we have a practicable vision? And I mean a real vision, not Xi Jinping bromides, a community of common destiny. Win-win situations. My, my mother used to refer to talk like this as, goodness is better than badness because it's nicer. Um, <laughs> it's just sort of this empty, bloviating language. One country, two systems. Uh, do we have a practicable vision for stable relations between a powerful, prosperous US and a powerful, prosperous China? Can we get there? The challenge is to move beyond overreach on China's part and overreaction on America's part. Uh, I think what Kaiser called this, this ongoing freak out. Um, and now, yes, we've recognized that this is going to be a contentious relationship. And I, I like that phrase better than competitive. I think competitive is a little too mild, adversarial is a little too strong. Um, the challenge, I think, now is to normalize contentious relations normalize competition, find a framework for it and a common understanding within which we can manage our enormous and high stakes disagreement. I don't believe that this is a new Cold War. I reject that analogy. But if we think back to the Cold War for a minute, we had normalized competition. I don't like your face. I don't like your face either. OK, well, let's sit down. And on that grounds, we know the limits of competition. We can compete when we must, we can cooperate when we must, and we were able to carry out things like arms control agreements because we had normalized competition. And that's the phase we need to enter into now. I think this is beginning to happen based on the writings I've seen from uh, the scholarly community where uh, a new paper, an updated paper actually from the Asia Society, another paper by uh, Hal Brands, Andrew Erickson, they're all trying to move beyond the freak out and define workable frames for this competition. So maybe we're getting there. I think the best way to normalize the relationship is to return to the, the traditional way of understanding the relationship, which is to get away from our fears and talk a little bit more clearly about American interests, limited bottom line interests vis-a-vis -vis China. And I would say there are three. One, to prevent Chinese dominance of East Asia Pacific while recognizing that we cannot ourselves dominate, and while, as uh, Shinbo mentioned, allowing for, allowing is the wrong word, because we don't really have a choice, um, but reframing increased Chinese influence. So dominance of the region, no. We must allow increased Chinese influence because we need to lower China's threat perceptions. Anything else is destabilizing. But China's dominance of the region uh, would be very strongly uh, harmful to the United States and its system of alliances. And that is a, an interest that is within our ability to carry out through, through our alliance systems. But again, no dominance, but recognize China's legitimate development of, of its military, its legitimate interests in the region. This calls on diplomacy. Number two, it's two of three interests, to prevent the global spread of illiberal Chinese practices. And again, here there's, there's a big caveat while acknowledging and welcoming China's increased ability to provide global public goods. And again, it is diplomacy that makes the difference between countering illiberalism and calling it out 
and acknowledging and even encouraging China as a provider of global public goods. And again, this is within our ken. This is doable. And then lastly, and we're doing less well on this, uh, we need to avoid a new arms race with China that will comprise not only nukes, uh, but space and cyber as well. And this means, uh, again, uh, engagement, diplomacy. It means working through uh, mechanisms to, uh, discussion mechanisms to build up new treaties and new understandings. We can do this. So against this background, US-China relations, what are they? In my view, US-China relations now are properly understood as a long-term historic dynamic, a structural dynamic. And what I mean is this contentious relationship is not primarily the fault of either one nation or the other. Some version of this was in the cards. It's a historic dynamic with a very long arc in which, in my view, China must learn to be a truly integrated world power despite its extremely deep civilizational instinct for insularity. And the United States must adjust to the fact of Chinese power, despite our preference for continued preeminence. And so if that or something like it is right, uh, it means that to manage this relationship peacefully, both countries have to change uh, in profound and difficult ways and to a degree uh, set aside their versions of exceptionalism. We both face very difficult choices in doing that. What we don't face, and this is something else that Washington doesn't understand, we have no choice about making a choice. A risen China is a truly epical development. And it is going to change, transform the United States profoundly, no matter what decision we make. Attempting to ignore China or to wish it away will change us. Trying to oppose China at every turn will change us in another way. Accommodating China fully and doing exactly what Xi Jinping would like, that would certainly change us. And that's not my recommended uh, course. And so I'm, I'm happy to subscribe to the four C's and go after them more closely uh, with Elizabeth. Uh, I think that if both nations find ways to change over the very long term, uh, then we can both find ways to prosper in this century, no matter who ends up claiming it. And I think that conferences like this are very helpful. Again, I'm so glad to be here. It's been a pleasure from beginning to end. And I've especially been impressed and a little bit surprised by the good humor in this room among such a, a serious <laughs> topic. And it reminds me of a story, um, Mark Twain, late in his career when he had mostly put down his pen and he was basically inventing the idea of the stand-up comedian going around the nation uh, just telling stories. And he was up in New England. I don't know where it was, but he was in a church. And so it was probably an audience about the same size as this one. And he was doing his usual routine and it was just American Gothic, stone-faced, nothing. <laughs> he felt, I'm dying up here. This is horrible. Uh, he cut it short to just to you know, put everybody at ease. He just ended it and got off the stage. And he was behind a column in front of the church as the audience, the New England audience was, was walking out. And he heard a man say to his wife, wasn't he funny? Wasn't he funny? <laughs> it was all I could do to keep from laughing. Uh, so anyway, thank you very much. Greatly enjoyed the conversation. Thank you.